Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the uh, UFC card for Saturday, April 30th, uh, main event being Rob Font versus Marlon Vera. Uh, obviously, we're looking at it from a DraftKings perspective, and it's, uh, it's a pretty interesting card. Last week, for those of you that participated, it was, it was quite, the, uh, quite the train wreck. We had a, D we had a DQ, we had, a, we had the chalkiest fighter on the slate uh, get canceled. Um, the fight got canceled after lock. So it was, it was quite a, it was quite a, quite a night for, for DFS players. Uh, not in a good way. Oh, but then again, I'm sure somebody won, right? Uh, they gave away a hundred thousand to somebody who both uh, faded uh, the, the 21, both 2100 out 21 to one favorites, you know, between uh, Barry over Jackson, Barry was winning was about to maybe knock him out and got DQ'd. And Romanoff, uh, he was minus 20 to one and he uh, was the fight that got canceled. So if you did fade both of those, you had a shot. In any case, um, this week, you have a couple of very similar looking, um, looking favorites. And it's, it's, this whole card has been really interesting to, to monitor all week from a, an industry perspective. And I've heard several different approaches to this. One was that basically all the underdogs are live to the point where you could even leave, you know, a thousand on the table. And then I heard other takes where the, where it was tough to find value, you know? And when you have slates like this, I think it is kind of important to just step back and, and go back to the numbers, you know, and, and just remember that, you know, if you're a 150 favorite, you're probably going to win 60% of the time. And that's pretty much it. Um, however, remember, all favorites are not created equal. They're, they're favorites that even if they win are not going to be what you want DFS wise. And they're underdogs, that even if they win, aren't, aren't going to be what you want DFS wise. Um, so let's go through kind of fight by fight. And what we're looking for, again, we're looking for those inside the distance props where you know, according to, to Vegas, the fight rates to finish uh, by, you know, uh, whether it be by uh, barely or whether it be minus two to one or just uh, relative to the rest of the slate pretty much. And in the absence of that, or maybe instead of that, you want the, the fights where the winner it rates to get a lot of uh, takedowns and control time and, and ground and pound and things like that, which are extremely conducive to DraftKings scoring. As we go through the, the card, you'll see that it's that second win condition that is most relevant for the upside this week. You'll see that, that several of those 9K fighters um, are priced that way and, who's, and, and they're in part because of their win, their win odds, but also they have extreme grappling upside in their wins. So you're not going to see them maybe have the, the, the KO prop or the inside the distance prop, but all of them, I would say most of them have that grappling upside, which is really important. So you'll be able to pick between several of these, uh, several of these fighters. Um, now the fight that I referenced earlier that got uh, canceled mid, mid, midstream last week is going to be run back this week. And that's going to be Alexander Romanoff as a 20 to one favorite over Chase Sherman. Now, uh, if the inside the distance prop isn't good enough, you know, like minus 800, you know what I mean, to go to, to finish. Um, it's also minus 300 to even finish within the first round and a half. And if that's not good enough, uh, Romanoff also has takedown and grappling upside. So um, you really could look at this almost as a, as a five slate um, slate. Um, you put in Roman off at 9,600 and then you kind of work the rest out. But, you know, I've seen a lot <laughs> and, and, and stuff can happen. And, and let me just remind you what can happen. Remember, he's going to be about 70% on, I would imagine. And number one, less likely, he could, he could get DQ'd, you know. The fight could get canceled post lock. We just saw it happen. Same fight. Um, Sherman could leg kick him and, and break his leg. You know, not to be gross, but all these things could happen. 
Are they going to happen more than one out of 20 times? I don't know. Um, but even still, Romanov could win and not cover. You know what I mean? Like he could win and not necessarily do enough to put up, say, 120 points, which is really what you need out of a $9,600 fighter. Um, especially when you have other fighters on the card that have grappling upset, you know? Um, I mean, I, I've seen this, you know, you take Romanov and Sherman just, you know, kicks him a little bit, stays away. Listen, Sherman might be some, you know, quote unquote, dumb fighter, but he's no idiot. I mean, he knows what Romanov's going to do. I mean, he knows that Romanov is going to be trying to come after him and, and take him down. So if Sherman really, really wants to sell out on defending the takedowns, I mean, it's possible he could, he could keep him off him for a round. And, and if he keeps him off, if he keeps Romanov off him for a round, you know, Romanov busts, you know? Um, so just be careful. Uh, listen, he is the best play. Um, and I am going to play a decent amount of it, but I'm not going to lock him in. Uh, I, I'm not going to play Sherman on the other side, but I think that there are lineup constructions that, that benefit from not having the $9,600 fighter in there. Um, so just, uh, just don't listen, just because it's the best play doesn't mean you have to play it. And, and I, I think that's a really important thing to remember about DFS. Um, because remember it's the best lineup and, and best also implies not just most likely to score the most points, but it's most likely to score the most points in relation to how many other entrants are going to have that same lineup. So uh, that's the first comment on Romanov uh, on, on this card, because you have to start with that, right? So let, let's go through some of these because some of these are very, very similar. So the, like the first two fights that I see here are very similar. You have Tatsura Taira, who is about a two to one favorite, minus 2.4 to one. And although his fight doesn't go to the decision line, it's pretty, pretty, you know, pretty mediocre at about pick him to minus 150. Um, He's got grappling upside. He's got takedown upside. He's got submission upside. So this is a this is a very strong play at you know at ninety two hundred. Let's 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 do this by by fight number. Okay. Um, so he's a very strong play in ninety two hundred. Is he as good a play at with Roman off in ninety six hundred? No. But first of all, you need six of them, six fighters. And second of all, I've already outlined that there are ways that Romanov can bust. And there are ways that Tyara, for example, can outscore him. And I promise you that Tyra is going to be, you know, half the ownership of Romanov. And if Tyra gets a hold of Candelario and puts it on him, I mean, I don't know if that's going to happen. It's possible. Um, he might get the 115, 120, where if Romanov comes out with 100, in a, in a, in a, even at a first round uh, finish, um, you know, you're gonna you're gonna be happy that you add Tyra. So so Tyra is a very, very, very reasonable, I want to say pivot, or you could play them both together. But that grappling upside makes plays like this really, really uh real good plays. To wit, okay. Um Gina Mazzani. So she again, she's not quite the same type of favorite as Tyra. She's only a 180, but she also has a win condition that's extremely conducive to to DraftKings scoring. I mean, she has she she's from the she's from the James Krause stable. She goes for takedowns. That's her main source of of uh, that's her main uh, her main weapon. And if you look at some of these, look at some of these results. I mean, she had one result where she had seven takedowns and 138 fantasy points. She had another one where she had three takedowns and 118 fantasy points. I mean, to the point. I mean, she only has two wins of her last seven or whatever. And yet all of them, both of her wins basically break the slate. So that's what I talk about with win condition. And, and, and the, the question is, is she going to win? I don't know, but it's likely, right? So if you want someone who's likely to win and when she wins, it's also very likely that she scores extremely well. I and mean, this is a very strong play in this army. So, so right off the bat, in the first two fights, you have Tyara and Mazzani. And, you know, both of these fighters have upside, I would say, similar to Romanov. Um, 
will they attain that upside as often as Romanov? I don't think so. But but certainly within within the range of outcomes is both of these fighters outscore Romanov. You know, so so I, I think that both of these fighters are extremely strong. Um, I do not like the other sides of these fights. I don't like Candelario. I don't like Young. If anything, I would prefer. Actually, that's not true. So, so, so I was about to say I prefer one or the other. I think if you did have to go for one of these as underdogs, I think they're both very similar. C Candelario is is kind of an unknown. Um, so you have like unknown variants, um, and then you have uh, Shanna Young, who, well, one thing about Gina Mazzani is that if she doesn't get what she wants, she's not very good on the feet, and she's also tired out before. So Shani Young kind of hangs in there. She does have a puncher's chance to get back into this and maybe even knock her out. So um, I think they're both okay underdogs, but they're not my favorite. Um, but I definitely think they're a good way to kind of start off the card. Um, Figueredo Lacerda. So you'll might, you might also see him referred to Lacerda as Daniel Da Silva. I mean, either way. Um, this is, is a fight which is, is, okay. I was about to say it's just not a really – good DFS fight and the quick answer is that's correct it's not but um it's hard to ignore the fact that they're, this price this 8k 8200 price usually is a price point that generates uh, a, a winner that has a good chance to be in the optimal and the reason why is that is that you know all you need out of these guys maybe 80 points to 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 get you in the optimal or at least get you 10x so, so, you know, unless the winner in this fight is, is, is by decision and a kind of a boring decision, um, this fight probably is live. But the thing is, is that this fight does have a very poor inside distance prop. I shouldn't say poor. It's about pick them, I guess. That's not that bad. Um, so maybe this fight is something that you can kind of put in there. It's not something I want to jam in. But if you run crunches or whatever, and you, or let's say you really like a couple of guys and you have 8,200 left, you can play one of these guys. Now, I will say that of these two fighters, I think that Figueredo is going to be low owned, lower owned, and a couple of reasons why I think that is. So, De Silva had kind of a decent performance in his last fight against, um, against Molina. I mean, he did get KO eventually, but, but Molina's, Molina's, a, Molina's a beast. Um, and Figueredo, I mean, his two fights in the UFC have been pretty uninspiring, I guess. Um, and he's just kind of already been known as the bad Figueredo because he's the brother of, 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 of uh, I think Devin, Devin? I forget, of uh, uh, Figueredo. Um, and I think he's getting a little bit too much hate <laughs> uh, just by the industry. I mean, maybe he's not as good as, but it's not like he's bad, right? I mean, he's got, he's got to win. You know, yes, 76 point. Listen, everything went exactly probably that. I mean, you get a decision and you only get 76 fantasy points, even with four takedowns. So he's probably not a great scorer, but I don't know. Um, I'm probably going to end up avoiding this fight, but I think if you had to choose between the two of them, just from ownership, maybe figure eight all makes a little more sense. But I don't know. This I'll probably get away from this one. All right, so Natan Levy versus um, uh, versus Mike Breed. Here's another 9K fighter um, that you have to consider here. And you have a 9K fighter that uh, is coming off of a fight where he had three takedowns. So likewise, it's a very similar situation to Gina Mazzani and Ciara. You have someone who's about a two-to-one favorite to win, priced at about 9K, who, um, well, Fight inside the distance is not great, but it's got some takedowns. So uh, I feel that he's very similar, maybe a little worse than Mazzani and Tyara, because I'm not exactly sure that, listen, uh, I know that Tyara is going to go for takedowns in jujitsu and things like that and grappling. I know that Mazzani is going to go for takedowns. I don't know for sure that Levy is going to go for takedowns. So, so you know, I think it's, you know, a decent chance he does, but if he doesn't, there is a chance he gets some kind of boring win. I don't feel that there's much of a route for Gina Mazzani to win without scoring well. I don't think there's much of a route for Tyara to win without scoring well. So 
That's the difference between all three of them. Um, so I think that Levy is probably a little bit worse play than those two, but not by much. Uh, and Mike Breeden, just I have just no interest in playing Mike Breeden. We are going to get to some okay long shots, but um, I don't think that uh, that Levy is, is that that Breeden is one of them. Um, they changed the order of the fight, so forgive me if I if I do so. So you have Gabe Green against uh, Leoness, and it's a pick 'em fight. And you have an inside the distance prop here, which is pretty strong. So you have minus 250, fight doesn't go to, to decision. And it's a really interesting fight because the, I think both of these fighters have good, good win conditions. In other words, you look at the win by um, TKO, you have Lane as, as a plus 200 to win by TKO, TKO, where Green is a plus 350, even though it's, it's a, um, even though it's a uh, it's a pick up fight, and the reason why is because you have Green is a plus three third to win by the sit, uh, submission. So again, you have kind of a, a, a kind of a cool fight where each fighter's win condition is really conducive to good scoring. You know, if, if Lainez wins, I mean, look, I'm going to say if he wins, like one third of the time he wins by KO. So that means that if he wins, he probably wins by KO probably fifty percent of the time that makes any sense um so he's really live and gabriel green again he's going over takedowns he's going for submissions and if he gets what he wants then he's going to be live and when you look at the at the at the pricing here you know 85 and 7700 that's a really strong you know price for uh, you know to try to get to these guys you could save a little salary off the top guys for gabe green and you could start building your underdog pool maybe with with Leonettes. Um, so I think this is a really, really important fight to kind of look at. Um, okay, uh, next one. Uh, we looked at the Silva Sherman. This next fight is going to be the death of me. Okay. Uh, Jocko Mearshart, because this is the fight where somewhere between 100% and 100% of the industry <laughs> is in complete agreement on what's going to happen and what you're supposed to do from a DFS perspective. And when that is the case, I have just seen too much in the last couple of years with MMA to know that it's just never that easy. Um, and that ownership is probably gonna overstate that narrative. So this is, I, I'm just gonna tell you reality and this is what what, what seems to be the case in this fight. But let's first just take a look at the odds and then whatever. So you have Jocko minus 160 and you have a very, you know, inside the distance line minus 135. You have Mearshart wins by KO plus 10. You have Jocko wins by KO is only plus 200. You have Mearshart winning by submission is plus 300, which is interesting, right? So you, you basically have Mearshart's, you know, almost as likely to finish this fight as Jotko is. Um, so that's, and that's, that's, that's the punchline here. This is what you will hear. It doesn't matter where you watch, what content, what site, this is what you will hear. Christoph Jotko is a terrible DFS player. When he wins, he fights a very boring fight. He's what they call a decisionator. And he doesn't throw a lot of volume. He doesn't get a lot of takedowns. He just kind of stays at range, does what he has to do. And look, in his last fight, he had a decision over Serkinov, and he scored 56 fantasy points. Whoever played him did not catch. Um, and you go through here, and it, it's not since 2018 that he had a, a finish. And even in his, you know, he just doesn't seem to score well. And yet, on the other hand, you have Gerald Mearshart who, you know, he's a $7,400 fighter coming off of three straight subs. You know, one, he was stole, but he was getting smoked and he somehow got the, he got the finish. Uh, he only scored 62 fantasy points with a finish, which is unlikely to ever happen. But then you have two straight fights where it was the underdog. One of them is some, a significant one where he just laid it on him and subbed him at 100 fantasy points. And you look at these other fights that he's in, KO, TKO, 
win by sub 95, you know, every one of this guy's wins win by sub, every one of his wins win by sub 124 points, you know, um, this is like the ultimate GPP guy. And this is the guy that you're supposed to be starting off your underdog pool with. So that is what the entire industry is kind of in agreement with. And I'm going to leave to you whether the ownership is going to be worth it. I mean, I just watch the ownership come on in. And I really feel as though your shark's going to end up being the chalk. Um, uh, the chalk underdog, whether it be him or, you know, or Vera in the main event, I think these two guys are going to garner a, and there's one other, by the way, garner a lot of ownership. And if you really want to, to be a pain in the ass, so to speak, you'll, you'll take Jocko at 8,800. He is going to be, he's got to be less than 10% owned, right? I mean, he's got all these other 8,800s that are, for all the reasons I mentioned are probably better plays, but this is MMA and this is variance. And, and, and remember when Mearshart loses, he gets finished and, uh, if Jotko can pull this off in the first round somehow at 8,800 at 10% ownership, you are the nuts. So I, in, in deep GPPs, I'm going to recommend doing this. I'm not going to fade Mearshart completely. He's got to be, listen, for all the reasons I mentioned, he's got to be in your player pool, right? He just has to be in the spider pool. But do not X Jotko out. You will go through, if you look at other industry, industry leaders, They'll, this will be your fade that everybody's going to say just to, not to play. I am advising you to not listen. I am advising you to, if you're playing 20 lineups, to have a share or two. Um, I've just seen this happen. Oh, listen, just, just a couple of weeks ago, you had Arnold Allen, who was the great decisionator. Okay. He, he'd scored 55 fantasy points like in his wins. Just boring. The only thing you were sure about on this whole card is that Arnold Allen was the one guy that wasn't going to finish him. And he broke the slate in, in one round. Listen, DF, MMA is a rough sport. You can get knocked out in the first round. Mirsar is prone to get knocked out. He's gotten finished, and he's not the favorite. You know, so he's favored to lose. Um, the only thing that's missing is Jot goes to kind of like aggression. But you know what? I mean, look, he's still an MMA fighter. He, he sees that he can get after a guy. I'm sure he's going to take advantage of it. So we'll see. That that could be my okay, the GPP leverage play of the week. Um, we'll see. We'll see how it um Connolly against Elkins um what I worry about this fight is that I didn't spend as much time on this one I kind of dismissed it early and the reason why that bothers me is that if I'm thinking that way I think a lot of people are thinking that way and this fight can be really overlooked but according to the numbers this is a fight that you're supposed to avoid it's uh neither of them have great grappling upside and the inside the distance prop is probably the worst on the slate so I would probably avoid this one. Um, all right. So Grant Dawson against Jared Gordon. Uh, this is one that could be a, an okay underdog as well. Um, fight doesn't go to the decision line is not great, though. Um, what you have here is Grant Dawson as yet another one of these guys that or in that 8,800 range that has grappling upside. He will go for it. He will go for it early. Um, and, and Jared Gordon can get taken down. So I would include Grant Dawson in that pool of Tyara, Mazzani, uh, maybe Levy. All four of these guys are very similar. They have pretty much similar winning upside, uh, win rates. They have pretty much similar styles and, and such. Um, Jared Gordon, I'm trying to talk myself into this, but it's hard. Because um, he doesn't really have that type of grappling upside. I mean, he does, does have a takedown or two. Um, I've heard that Grant Dawson doesn't really have the greatest cardio, but this, that's all factored into the price. Like, what, what, is make, what makes Jared Gordon a better underdog than, say, Shani Young? You know, what, what makes Jared Gordon that much a better underdog than Mike Breed? They're the same odds. You know, I, I, I've, I've heard Jared Gordon kind of referred to as, as, as a good underdog this week, but I don't 
I don't understand why he should be any different than a Shanna Young or a Mike Breeden or a Carlos Candelera. Carlos Candelera's guy, you know, he's got worse win odds or whatever it is. I mean, I know I can see why Jared Gordon would be a worse underdog than Mearshart, right? Because Mearshart in his wins, he has, you know, his win condition is just much more conducive to huge scoring. But I don't see why Jordan, why Gordon is any, I, well, but, but, well, I was going to say, I don't, I can see certainly why he's worse than Mearshart. What I was saying is that I don't see why he's better than those others. Okay. So I think Gordon, if he shows up with the ownership, maybe, maybe fade that a little bit. Um, okay. Andre Feely against Yo, Yo, uh, Yoan Anderson Brito. Um, is this the second to last fight? No, there are. I mean, what happened to that fight? Brito. Oh, Brito versus Feely. So you have 9,300 versus a 6,900 fight. And let's take a look at the, the inside the distance prop here. You have Feely. So this is a fight doesn't go decision line, which is pretty poor. And you don't have the really the same type of wrestling upside. So for me, I mean, no thanks. You know, I I I, I would probably avoid Feely. Um, I I don't. Let's take let's let's drill down here in some of these sub sub props here. I mean, you got Feely winning by submission plus eight fifty, so it's not that. You see, Feely winning by TKO is plus two fifteen, but is that good at ninety three hundred? You know, compare him to look at look at Leonez. Leonez is a better, more likely to win by TKO than Feely, and Leonez is eight K. You know, so I have no interest in playing Feely. You know, he's got a good win odds, whatever. But you know what? I know a lot of guys can win. I'm not interested. In this. Andre Arlovsky versus uh, and Brito. Let's take a look at Brito's uh, uh, win condition. Is he plus twelve hundred by TKO? Ouch. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't see it. Uh, I, I just don't see the uh, the, the Brito side here. So Collier Olavsky, what's interesting about this is the pricing. Let's take a look at the inside the distance prop. Again, it's poor. The grappling upside is not great. Uh, if anything, Collier might have the volume to, to win this one. But I don't think I need this. I don't know. I think I want to fade this fight as well. And then in the main event, uh, as usual, five rounds. Uh, kind of tough to fade five round fights in general. And let's look at the odds here and, and the inside the distance problem. This is probably pick them to get to decision. And if you go through kind of the drill downs, the finishing upside is more, it's really interesting because the finishing upside is actually more for fonts. Like you have, well, I shouldn't say that. You have fonts winning by uh, you have Vera winning inside the distance plus 300. You have Fon winning inside this plus 300. So both of them are, 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 are sort of the same. And as far as the win odds go, you have Fon is just a little bit better, more likely to win, right? Because he's minus one third. So I guess Fon is like a little bit of a better play. And you know what? He's a little bit of a higher price. So I think that this line is extremely efficient. Okay. Um, and as a result, you probably want to play both of them. And if it means playing more Vera to get what you want um, in other spots in your lineup, then play more Vera. But I feel as though that there's really no edge to be had on either side of this fight. I think it's priced very well, very efficiently, and they're all good plays. Though. They're both good plays. They're both they're priced well, and that one is not priced better than the other. Okay. Um, I think they did a good job with this one, except for the fact that it's a five round fight and they, they, they're just, they, they both should be probably 10 K, you know, but, but that's, that's not the way it's done uh, for some reason. Um, I'll give you one kind of inside the distance prop or one kind of, uh, line or live betting thing. And this is, 
Yeah, I don't know why I've become such a so jaded all of a sudden, but but the, these types of takes over um, have done really really well if you've tracked them in, in my MMA picks like this. So this is this is what I've been hearing. Marlon Vera is an extremely slow starter. He almost gives rounds away, and then just kind of comes on at the end. And people have been saying that, oh my God, Marlon Vera finally get him a five round fight so he can you know, show his ability to start slow and kind of ramp that off. So what I've heard logically is what you're supposed to do if you play Vera is wait. That is wait for him to lose the first round. And then as a result, when Font goes from a minus 125 to minus maybe a minus 180 or minus 200 after winning the first round, then you could get Vera at a you know, at a really, really good price. Um, and, you know, and, and, and this is part of Vera's game plan. So, you know, the casinos were not built on charity. And I don't believe DraftKings Sportsbook and the Sportsbooks are built on charity either. So I believe that that line that I just mentioned is going to be extremely overvalued. That if Font does in fact win the first round, I think that the play is going to be to play Font. Um, just based on what I just said, the fact that it's such an obvious thing to do to just let, let's wait, let's see Vera and, you know, let, let Vera lose the first round and then I'll play him at like minus 130 or plus 130 or plus 140, whatever it is. So my advice to you is that if in fact font does win the first round to play fonts with the idea that your line is going to be inflated, inflated meaning in your benefit. So if you're only laying 150, I'll bet you that the real odds are minus 200 and you're getting a discount because everybody's trying to be a wise and higher uh, with, with the same logic that I just mentioned. Um, I'm going to be out. Actually, am I going to be out? I might, I might actually be back for that fight. So I might, I might put my money where my mouth is and do something like that. Now it's not going to work. If I thought like really beats the crap out of him in the first round, then you're probably going to, you know, then there's going to be no edge to be had, but if thought just barely edges it out, you know, Oh, but, but you know that he won the first round. You know, but you could tell that like Vera was kind of, you know, coming on at the end. Um, I'm not going to bite. I'm going to just go take Font again uh, to win the fight. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, hopefully you guys have a good weekend and uh, let's uh, let's take this down.